our webinar today. We are very excited to have you with us. My name is Lily and I work for the Nature Conservancy in New Jersey. We have a really beautiful webinar lined up for you today and we are excited to get started. So with that, I would like to introduce our guest speakers. You'll be hearing from Eric Olson, who has worked for the Nature Conservancy in New Jersey since 2006 and currently serves as the Director of Lands and Rivers. In this role, leading a team of six, he directs the land protection, river restoration, habitat connectivity, land management, and land and river policy work for the chapter. From the Woodlands Wildlife Refuge, we have Tracy Lieber, who has served as the founder and executive director, director for Woodlands Wildlife Refuge for 35 years. The organization has grown from Tracy's spare bedroom and the care of only two raccoons to now an 11 acre facility, which cares for 1700 animals with the help of four staff, 50 volunteers and 10 interns annually. Melissa Anahori is currently the Program and Operations Assistant at Woodlands Wildlife Refuge. She became involved with Woodlands when she was an intern at the refuge in the summer of 2008 while studying natural resource management at Rutgers University, and she has consistently been involved with the refuge ever since. Heather Freeman is the Wildlife Care and Volunteer Supervisor. Heather began in the field of wildlife rehabilitation in 2006 as a volunteer for Woodlands while earning her bachelor's degree in biology and finishing her military service. In 2011, Heather joined the staff team at Woodlands and became licensed in 2013. And for those who may not be familiar, Woodlands Wildlife Refuge is a nonprofit re wildlife rehabilitation facility located in Hunterton County, New Jersey. They're dedicated to receiving, caring for, and releasing orphaned and injured wildlife and educating the public about wildlife habits and habitats. So before we get started, um, I just wanna go through some general housekeeping items. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. We will also be sending a follow-up email after the webinar with a link to the recording, as well as some other resources. Live captions are available during this session. To access them, click the live transcript button on your screen and select show subtitle. And just a reminder that the caption box is movable, so you can place it wherever is most convenient for you on your screen. Should you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And lastly, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but I just want to encourage our audience to stick around for the end of the presentation because we have some very special guest appearances from Woodlands Wildlife Refuge. Okay. And real quick, um, the Nature Conservancy and Woodlands have worked together for several years now, um, but we've put together this really adorable video to kind of show you how and why this collaboration got started. We just got these four baby raccoons and they're only about two months old, so way too young to be on their own. Unfortunately, it's such a common occurrence here at Woodlands Wildlife Refuge that we get animals in where the parent has been trapped out. When the animals first come in as infants, of course, we're giving them the closest replacement that we can to their mother's milk. And then we slowly wean them onto solid foods. And by the time we move them into outside enclosures, we're giving them food that closely mimics what they would be eating in the wild. One of the most difficult things that we go through as the caregivers of these wild animals is, um, can we do enough? Can we replace, you know, what their mom would do for them as a human being, you know? We have given these guys the best of our abilities with nutrition, they're gaining weight, we have our fingers crossed, and we just hope that eventually we will be able to send them back out. I did that pause. I'm sorry about that. I don't know that pause. We just got these. Sorry about that. I don't know. 
We have given these guys the best of our abilities with nutrition. They're gaining weight. We have our fingers crossed, and we just hope that eventually we will be able to send them back out. In New Jersey, it's the densest populated state in the U.S., and we have a huge network of roads to help people get around, but it interrupts a lot of the habitat that animals need to get around. My position at the Nature Conservancy is focused on understanding how and where wildlife are crossing roads, and this is a big effort to reduce wildlife mortality on roads. The Nature Conservancy, we protect habitat, and that's exactly what the animals at Woodlands need. So now that we're ready to release these raccoons, we're gonna be taking them back to the home range that they originally came from, which thankfully is Nature Conservancy property. Woodlands has many animals that need habitat, and the Nature Conservancy has preserves that offer that habitat, so it's quite a natural collaboration. Releasing a raccoon and watching it come out and touch around on the ground and feel all of those things for the first time, that's the fulfilling part for me, is to see them go, wow, there's no cage, there's no wall, there's, there's nothing, it's just me and where I'm supposed to be. Awesome, I just love that video. And now that you all have some background information about TNC and the Woodlands collaboration, we are ready to get started. And I would like to welcome our first guest speaker, Eric Olson. Thanks, Lily. What a lovely video. Thanks for sharing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Nature Conservancy is doing some pretty cool work in the Appalachians, and I know you'll be uh, pretty proud of this. One of the most important places on the globe, the globe, I want to hammer that home, for biological diversity is the Appalachian Mountains. This landscape stretches nearly 2,000 miles from Alabama to the Canadian Maritimes. It includes portions of 18 states and three provinces. It's a vast area. These maps show how the Appalachians as a landscape can contribute to addressing both the biodiversity and the climate crises. The image on the left shows the outline of the Appalachian landscape with important climate resilient lands habitats identified in dark green. The image on the right is a map of forest carbon storage across the eastern United States. Darker green areas are storing more carbon in their forests. And you can see the Appalachians light up on both of these maps. And we can see that the same forest we need to conserve to secure a future for biodiversity, wildlife, plants, and animals are also critical living carbon reserves. It is also important to note that this region also provides countless benefits to us people, residents, through drinking water protection, pollution mitigation, and the recreational economy, just to name a few. Next slide. This region is important because of its physical diversity. It has a mixture of topography, hills and valleys, a variety of soil types, and beautiful river valleys like this one in the Canaan Valley in West Virginia. These long ridges and valleys you see here in this photo are emblematic of those that exist throughout the entire Appalachian range. And it's these that contribute to the high number of plant and animal species that live here. Because of this mix of high and low elevations provide options for species to migrate and move around through periods of warming and cooling. Next slide. Most critically, much of this landscape is connected naturally through its large blocks of forests. The wildlife diversity in the Appalachians is driven in part by the richness and diversity of the forest types. Deciduous forests of sugar maple, oaks and hickories, these are trees that lose their leaves in the wintertime, are home to bobcat, porcupine and red fox, all things we love. And the cani coniferous forests, those that don't lose their leaves, are red spruce and balsam fir, are home to lynx and pine marten and red squirrels. This photo is of the big woods in Maine. And it's these forests and other habitat types in the Appalachians that provide the backdrop for wildlife to thrive. Next story, next slide. Now, as climate change alters habitats and disrupts ecosystems, we ask where will species go to adapt? 
Now, will human development prevent them from moving to access areas that they need for, to live out their lives? Now, researchers from the University of Washington and the Nature Conservancy modeled potential habitat for nearly 3,000 species using climate change projections and the climactic needs of each of these species, those 3,000 species. And this map shows the general direction that animals and plants will need to move to track hospitable climates as they shift across the landscape. So the pink uh, dots that you see moving there are mammals, the blue are birds, and the yellow are amphibians. And these plotted movement routes for each species are connecting current habitats that they currently reside in with their projected locations under climate change. One click, Lily. And you can see here, it's hard to see with this little red circle here, but you can see here <laughs> that New Jersey is in the middle of this movement superhighway, if you call it that, this Appalachian. So you see these movement corridors along the Appalachian Mountains along the East Coast here. New Jersey is at a critical pinch point in that it connects habitats in the Southern Appalachians with those in the North. And our conservation work in Northwest New Jersey is ensuring that this corridor stays intact. Next slide. It's important for you to know that only 26% of the Appalachian landscape, Alabama to Canada, is permanently protected today. It's not enough. So TNC is focused on a future that ensures the long-term protection and con connectivity of this Appalachian landscape. Our vision is bigger than ever before. Uh, we're working from Alabama to Canada to accelerate the protection of critical habitats throughout this landscape. And what I find especially inspiring about our work in the apps, as we call it, it's a hopeful story. There is an incredible potential for this landscape to provide a pathway for nature as the climate changes, while also helping to mitigate the changing climate. And you can read more about the Nature Conservancy's work if you just look at uh, nature.org uh, slash Appalachians. And so now that you know a little bit more about this really critical landscape right outside, if you live in New Jersey, you know, you just drive to North Jersey, it's right here. Now that you know a little bit more about this important region, I want you to learn a, a lot more about the important wildlife that make their home here in the Appalachians and in New Jersey and what the great organization, the Woodlands Wildlife Refuge is doing to re rehabilitate animals that are injured in the wild. So I guess I'll turn it over to Tracy. Thanks Eric for that. And thanks everybody for joining us for a wild and crazy lunch hour. Uh, we could talk forever about the wild animals that we work with. Today, we're going to be concentrating on a few of those, but, um, you know, feel free to, to visit us, our website, our Facebook page for, in, for ongoing information about all of the things that we're doing. I'm very excited to be participating in this today with the Nature Conservancy. As you've heard already, it's a great partnership. Um, so, most of the animals that we care for at Woodlands Wildlife Refuge, and again, we receive, rehabilitate, and our goal is to release these animals back out, come to us because of some sort of human interference. It could be that the animals are hit by cars, um, they're often found and caught by kids, by pets, uh, there's construction issues that you know um, affect wild animals, home renovations, yard work, all of the things that we do as humans around our own property and space, and a myriad of other types of things <clears throat> that end up disturbing natural habitats and nesting and den sites of all of the wild animals that we work with. So as you can imagine, um, as you saw in the previous video, that being the most densely populated state in the country, these things, these interferences, these human encounters with wild animals happen quite often. Uh, partnering with the Nature Conservancy is a perfect fit. So preserving the land and thus a wide variety of the diverse, the, the diverse habitat um, greatly increases our joint opportunities to educate the public, 
about the importance of land preservation, about our native wildlife, and greatly expands our opportunities at Woodlands to choose the best possible release sites. Uh, definitely a win-win all around. We'll be covering just a couple of the species that we work with that utilize and depend on the important area of the Appalachians that we're talking about today, um, that the Nature Conservancy has already and continues to work on preserving. And as Eric said, it's, it's critically important um, for the land, for the environment, and for the crazy number of wild animals that move through that area. What's amazing to me in our presentation today and just in this general conversation is that, and hopefully it's really inspiring to those that are with us this afternoon, that um, these animals coexist with the humans here in New Jersey. And again, a reminder that it is the most densely human populated state in the country. These animals are our neighbors. As wild as they might be as neighbors, they are our neighbors. Um, this makes the hard work and the efforts of both our organizations um, incredibly important to continue working and to, you know, encourage others to, to help to preserve both habitat, understand and inspire tolerance <clears throat> of the wildlife species that we work with. The, again, the, the animals that we will be discussing today all use the land that we're talking about today. Um, and I wish we could focus on all of them, but we would need about a week to do that. Uh, so let's start with the largest animal that we work with at Woodlands Wildlife Refuge. Not so large there on the left, um, but let's talk about the incredible black bear. In 1995, Woodlands started the Black Bear Rehabilitation Project in New Jersey. And since then, we've cared for more than 100 bears. They come to us as very young cubs usually like the ones that you see on the left side of the slide here, um, and usually between April and July. Right now, out there, today as we're talking here in New Jersey, that the black bears are out of their dens. Um, they've been out for a while, <clears throat> and the cubs will be out soon, and start if they're not already, and start following their mothers around. So things are, things are getting active again here. Um, and again, usually between April and July is when we might receive an orphaned or injured uh, black bear cub. They come to us sometimes because the den has been destroyed. Um, the mother might have been killed by a car. A cub may have been hit by a car. And fairly often, we don't know why an orphan cub has been found and has been seen just wandering alone. <clears throat> That's fairly common with a lot of the species that we work with. We don't have any answers as to why that animal was alone. We've had, had, we've had cubs come in as young as a week old, and we've had them come in a little, we've had animal, bears come in that are maybe more like a year old. Most often they're like the one pictured here. Um, the two here that are cuddled nice and cute, they're on the left, so, left side of the slide. But by the time we release them, if we've done our job well, and they've cooperated well, hit or miss there on their part, um, they're gonna look like the one that's pictured on the other part of the slide. Our goal is to release well-functioning and healthy animals back out into the wild. There have been as many as 15 bear cubs in our care at one time. Um, that was quite an interesting year. We did a lot of work. Um, we did release them all, which was really great. But most of the time we have average over the years that we've been working with bears, about two to three a year. So not, not a real common animal at Woodlands Wildlife Refuge, but maybe one of the animals that are in our care for um, almost the longest time. As with all of the other species that we work with, we care for them, take care of whatever needs they have come in with, um, and we release the animals at their natural age of independence. So we're following the natural progress of what they would be experiencing in their maternal world out in the wild. So with bears, they stay with their mom for 18 months. So when we get them in, they're here with us for about a year and we're releasing them back out after 18 months of babysitting really big bear cubs. 
Uh, as you can imagine, this is an incredible amount of work and a lot of food uh, to take that small cub that had an orphan from a bottle feeding stance and housed in a small carrier through the weaning process, which is never fun because they never want to wean off their formula when they first come in. Uh, it's quite a project to releasing that same animal a year later at over 100 pounds and from a 4,000 square foot natural habitat that we've you know, been using for many years to be able to set them free to roam out there as well-functioning wild bears that if we've done everything right and they've done everything right, cannot be even, you can't tell the difference between that bear that's been rehabilitated and released and the wild population that it came from originally. The black bear has an incredibly large home range. The male black bear could roam hundreds of miles if it really wanted to. It's miles and miles and miles for both the male and the female. So you can see right there that that's just one really good example of one species that depends greatly on the preserved land, the contiguous habitat that's so important and the upside of all of that, besides just the environmental aspect of that, is that their human encounters can be minimized if we continue to preserve and protect as much land that they move through as possible. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. And the next slide. Hey everybody, I'm Melissa. Um, yes, we do indeed have beavers in New Jersey. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. Um, beavers really thrive in woodland habitats that are adjacent to streams, lakes, marshes, and rivers, um, which we just learned a little bit ago is a um, critical part of the Appalachians. Beavers are ecologically important um, because not only do they create dams, which help reduce soil erosion, um, but they also create wetlands, which then creates habitat for several other species, including waterfowl, amphibians, and other semi-aquatic mammals like muskrats and otters. Um, the beavers live in these interesting family units. Um, they're referred to as colonies. And they really work together to not only repair the dams and lodges, um, but to raise the young. And those young stay with the family unit for up to two years. Um, after two years, they are either driven away um, or they disperse on their own to go off and start their own colonies as well. In rehabilitation, um, as you can imagine, like Tracy mentioned, we keep the animals until their natural age of independence. Um, so for a beaver, that means we have to keep it uh, for the first two years of its life. Beavers arrive for several reasons, including injuries um, similar to the other species we have talked about, um, hit by cars and, and other accidents like that, um, occasionally illnesses um, and orphanings. And like Tracy said, for the bears, um, often we don't know uh, why those young are orphaned um, and we just call that orphaned for unknown reason. But these beavers are the species that we care for the longest. Um, so that entails um, several years of species specific diets um, and very particular uh, enclosures that we have for them um, until they can be released. So as you can imagine, after um, years of effort, it is very crucial to have the proper habitat um, to release these magnificent animals back into. Um, and they play that really important role in creating the habitat for um, their other wild neighbors that they coexist with. Next slide, please. All right, bobcats. Um, we do have bobcats in New Jersey as well. Um, 
Bobcats nearly went extinct locally in the 1970s. Um, they were really in trouble. And although the populations have made a comeback with some different conservation efforts, um, one of the main things that's um, detrimental to them right now is habitat loss and fragmentation, which continues. Uh, this is just one of the reasons that bobcats continue to be an endangered species in New Jersey. Um, so it is very, very rare um, to see one, and it is very crucial to have uh, species-specific habitat for them, such as Bobcat Alley that TNC um, is helping to protect, and that's really critical to their survival. Um, because of that habitat fragmentation, um, that's kind of pushing the bobcats more into roadways and um, things like that, which um, is ultimately affecting their populations. Tracy actually started the Bobcat Rehabilitation Program in New Jersey back in 1997. And to date, Woodlands has rehabilitated and released over 35 bobcats back into the wild. Um, so again, because it's an endangered species and there's all this effort to rehabilitate them, it's critical for us to have the proper habitat for them to go back to. So that's where our partnership um, with TNC um, really, really comes in handy. The reason we get bobcats is mostly due to injuries such as car strikes. Um, occasionally they are accidentally um, caught in traps set for other species. Um, and sometimes we get orphan kittens. Again, the orphan kittens, often we don't know um, why, and it's usually just a single orphan. Their uh, range of stay um, depends on why they came in. So that can be just a few weeks to several months if it's a young bobcat that needs to be raised. Um, so again, the effort to raise that animal um, or rehabilitate it from its injuries, it's critical to have uh, an ideal place for it to go back to. And with that, I will turn it over to Heather so she can teach you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Melissa. So I would like to talk to you about the two animals that are photographed here. On the left, you've got an Eastern box turtle. And on the right, we have a timber rattlesnake. And yes, both are in New Jersey. I'm gonna talk about the box turtle first. So this species in the last few years has been on the list of special concern. So that means they are coming close to being threatened in their populations and that could lead to being endangered. And that's surprising because box turtles are everywhere, right? They're, they're so common and they're definitely one of the more common reptiles that we see here at Woodlands. But it's this habitat loss that is causing their populations problems. It's the roadways coming through. If you think about the size of a box turtle, when it's crossing a road and it comes up to a curb, it's stuck. It can't even go over the curb. So there are major problems out there in the habitats for these animals. And box turtles have very small home ranges. They hatch and they live their entire lives out within a quarter mile range. That's their home range. They don't go beyond it. So it can't be an animal that somebody quote, rescues from the road and then moves it to a whole nother part of the state, that animal is not likely to survive a move like that. So it's a real, another big problem with human interference where people are trying to do the right thing, but they need some more education on what that right thing is. The biggest thing is if you find a turtle in the road and it's not injured, just help it cross the road. Um, do not move it out of its home range. It needs to just continue its journey safely on the other side of the road, right? So the box turtles are really amazing. Again, it's the most common turtle that we see here and most of them are hit by cars and those injuries bring them into our care. And some of them might get chewed by dogs because if a dog were to find a box turtle, it's just a chew bone to a dog. So they, they get chewed on, unfortunately. 
Um, but we're so thankful that anybody that finds these turtles cares so much to actually get them to a rehabilitator for help, because that's what we're here for. So we can treat these animals and hope to release them back into their habitat in the wild. And that could take, um, depending on the injuries, that could take a wide range of time. So if we get it early in the summer and it's injured, we're hoping to help it heal from those injuries by the end of the summer so we can get that animal back out before it needs to go into hibernation or brumation for the winter. In our case, if a turtle is not healed by the time we hit to about mid-September, then we will overwinter that animal in order to release it the following spring. So that's our goal with them. Um, and, we're, and we just really are amazed at the healing powers of turtles and many reptiles and, and a lot of the animals that we work with, which is, it's just amazing. Um, and these box turtles, they're living in very wooded habitats. And then they are, again, like Tracy said, they're our wild neighbors. So it's not uncommon to just find them in our yards because we're building up our homes and our businesses within their habitat. And another part of that too is if, since they have such small home ranges, if something is built, if there's some kind of construction and a strip mall goes up or, or their habitat is completely lost, then that turtle cannot be released back. It can't be released elsewhere. It no longer has a home to go back to. And that's a struggle. We actually have a permanent resident Eastern box turtle with that exact story that we use in our education programs because that's one of the things that our human, um, our human activities are affecting these species. So I also wanna to talk to you about the timber rattlesnake in the picture to the right. So yes, we do have timber rattlesnakes in New Jersey. They're one of the two venomous species in the States and they are so, so misunderstood. Um, they really are, you know, we can say that for most of the snakes, but especially the venomous snakes. And we are thankful to, again, any person that wants to try to help these animals and get them into rehabilitation is amazing. Um, and we work with the biologists for venomous species and potentially dangerous species. So typically it's them bringing us those animals. The timber rattlesnakes really like rocky wooded areas. So definitely the Appalachians and they're living in there. And the biggest thing when you're out in the environment is just stay on the trails, right? Um, but for the most part, these snakes are hiding in crevices and they're just minding their business. And I think what's really interesting that a lot of people may or may not know is while they are predators and they eat a lot of mice and small rodents, they're also a big prey species to some of raptors and even other animals that will eat snakes. So it's very interesting. They're so important to the web of life and that food chain, right? Um, we've started working with the venomous species around 2013. And since then we've had over a dozen rattlesnakes come in here and there. Um, some of them have been potential car hits or just clipped by a car, just injured enough that they're alive, but they um, are not able to move on by, their, by themselves. So they come in for rehabilitation. We've had a few that have unexplained injuries that they come in and they just need time to heal. We currently do have one rattlesnake in-house now that came last summer and just needed more time to heal a large wound on its side. So it's planning to be released this spring, which is very exciting. And we're at the time of year now in March where we're coming up to where these reptiles are gonna start becoming more active. There have already been sightings of garter snakes. Um, some of the other animals that hibernate or brumate have started to come out. The box turtles and the rattlesnakes typically start coming out next month. So just to be aware of their activity times. And I'll go next slide. Okay, here we have a red fox. And yes, that picture on the left is a red fox. This is what young foxes look like. That photo on the left is a fox about almost two weeks old. Their eyes open around 10 or so days. And then I think many people are familiar with what the adult red fox looks like. 
So it's really interesting to see these young foxes and how they barely even look like foxes. And anytime we get them in, um, a lot of people don't even know what they found. You know, is it a fox? Is it a coyote? Is it a ferret? We don't know. So um, as rehabilitators at Woodlands, we can identify this as a red fox. And we were excited to show this picture. So we get a good amount of red foxes between orphaned young or injured adults or young juveniles or even adults that get mange a lot. So we see a lot of foxes, probably 30 or so throughout the year, which actually isn't that many compared to the hundreds of squirrels and raccoons and rabbits that we see every year, but still a lot of foxes and they typically come around the same time of the year. Um, last year was a big year for foxes and we had almost double our usual number of red foxes. Right now we have six young kits about the size of the one in the photo on the left, um, three siblings and three singles that came in for various reasons. A few were just found alone and we don't know why they needed to come in. The, uh, the three siblings that came in together, they were found alone at their den and no parents came around. So sometimes the parents do get hit by cars. And I say parents because the mother and the father fox, the male and the female, both care for the young and they den just for when those kits are young. So that's this time of year. That left photo of that young fox, that's what they look like now. So they're in their dens, their parents are taking care of them. They're not even coming out of the den yet. That's why it's so rare to see that photo on the left or a fox that young, because they're not typically coming out yet. The parents are bringing them food, the mother is still nursing them. And as they get older and get later in the summer, those kits will start to follow the parents and hunt with them. And after that, they leave that den. So they're not using a den year round, they're only using maternal dens. So um, while the kits are young and need that protection of the den. So that's what's happening now and when we rehabilitate them, we are going to mimic what would be happening in the wild. So we are giving them a nutritious formula milk replacer if they're young enough to be nursing. And then we are eventually weaning them to solid foods um, and meats and, and vegetables. They're very opportunistic feeders. And once they're weaned, we're moving them to outdoor enclosures where they can dig, they can forage. They even like to jump in and get on high, high spots and look down below them. And then toward midsummer, they're ready to be on their own when they would be normally following their parents out. And that's our goal is to release them when they're, when they're naturally becoming independent at that age. And that's our goal with all of the animals to release them at their natural age of independence. And with the adults, we are getting them through whatever brought them in, whatever injury or ailment brought them in. So that could take a month, it could take longer. And then we want to release them back to where they came from. So the land to be able to release them back is essential. You know, it's just gonna keep coming back to that. We can't do our work without having the land to return these animals back to, right? Next slide. Okay, so in case you needed our information again, this is our website and our we are on social media. And I would just like to show you a little bit around our center. I can show you into our education center and then into the hospital. So I'm gonna turn you around. Here is our education center with our wonderful displays and several resident animals. We have a couple box turtles and a corn snake, a diamondback terrapin and a possum currently in this part of our facility. And we do education programs year round in this part of our facility. And I am going to walk out of this part of the building and into our hospital. So we also have some outdoor enclosures, our reptile area and some enclosures for our outdoor permanent residents here on the property. And then we will enter into our hospital.
So this is our hospital where we're caring for all of the animals before they can either be released or move out into outdoor enclosures. And we'll see some special patients. Those are some of those red foxes I talked about. This is our infant care room with many incubators, mostly full of Eastern gray squirrels. Most of them are covered and buried. You may be able to see. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heather, for first of all, for all of the information from Woodlands and for giving us the, you know, private virtual tour of your facility and showing us some of your patients who are absolutely adorable. <laughs> and I think now we are going to go ahead and um, we're going to open it up for some questions. And I already have a few here from some of our audience members. So how do you make sure that you do not over socialize the animals to humans so they're not in danger of approaching people once they are released? I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Tracy. I guess I'll go ahead and take that. Um, yeah, so our goal is to get these animals back out as if they never came in so that their life was interrupted and we're trying to get them out as if it wasn't. So it starts with the initial care when they come in as infants. Of course, it's gotta be hands-on because they're infants, we have to hand feed them. But what we do is we, we actually follow the natural progression. If you think of any, any young animal or person actually, they're going to become independent sooner or later. Um, and in the wild that happens in stages. The mom will be taking care, taking care, taking care. And then she slowly starts to bring it food that it can eat. And she slowly starts to push it away to make it learn how to do things on its own. That's, that's really the infant or the, or the um, juvenile following the mom out in the wild and experiencing that habitat, which is giving it its skills. So every step along our way, we go from bottle feeding to weaning onto food that simulates the natural food to giving it things as natural as possible that we can find from out there that it will be to moving it into pre-release caging, which has everything that they need to experience their life in the wild, except for freedom. And then we move them out into appropriate habitat. What we do as caregivers along the way is wean ourselves off or wean them off of our handling them. As cute and as adorable as they all are, we don't want to keep them. We don't want them to be pets. We don't want them to habituate to human beings. And we do everything we can along the way to minimize our contact with them. So a, a good example is the, the raccoons is um, once they're moved into outside caging and we, they're weaned off on, onto natural food and they're in outside caging, they're out there and we only provide food at the time that they would naturally be foraging. We leave the area undisturbed, we literally throw food, we scatter food so that we're not giving it to them in bowls, things like that. We try to make their last few weeks of life here at Woodlands, it goes from the the very maternal caring when they're tiny to the, we're literally like throwing food in the cage, making sure everybody is okay, everybody's functioning properly, and then they're out. So we, we kick them out just like mom kicks them out at their natural age of independence. And uh, we work really hard at making sure that they're not people friendly before they go. It's important to us. We want them to be successful. It's a good question. Great, thank you for that answer. I believe the next question here is for Eric. 
what is TNC doing in the Appalachians to make sure that animals have this habitat for the future? That's a good question. Uh, we're doing a lot of land protection work, working with partners and, and Nature Conservancy ourselves are preserving parcels. So working with landowners and, and buying it and turning it into preserves or new parks or new wildlife management areas, new national parks, new national wildlife. So it really runs the gamut. So that's a major emphasis. And then a growing number of uh, TNC programs are also digging deep on the impacts of the transportation network on wildlife, as you heard loud and clear from uh, the Woodlands presentation, you know, our roads have a significant impact on, on animals. You know, anytime you are driving and you see a raccoon or a groundhog or a skunk on the side of the road, smat, that's, that's an animal trying to get from one habitat to another crossing a road, trying to find water, trying to find mates, trying to find food. And uh, there are some things that we could do better as humans uh, to mitigate those impacts. Um, you know, in, in some states they build wildlife overpasses. In fact, we do have a couple in New Jersey. If you've ever been on Route 78, uh, going from Newark uh, out to the, to the Pennsylvania, you'll there are these bridges that look like they're overgrown. Those were actually constructed as overpasses for wildlife to get from one side of the highway to the other. And we also construct underpasses, you know, culverts that funnel animals from one side of the road to another. So we do, as humans, uh, do, do some things, uh, but we could be doing more work. And so those are some of the things that T uh, TNC is doing uh, to improve the, the conditions for wildlife. Great, thank you, Eric. Let's see, we had a fox in our yard two days in a row recently. Its coat looked pretty scrappy. Is it just shedding a winter coat or could it have mange? Okay, this is Heather, I'll take that one. So we would love for you to send us some pictures so we can get a better idea of what you're seeing. However, if it looks scrappy, it more leaning toward the potential of mange because they're naturally shedding shouldn't make them look patchy or anything. Um, that being said, mange in itself is not life threatening. And since we are getting into warmer weather, it's likely that this animal has overcome it on its own and it's doing well. But if we were to see a photo, we could also assess what else is going on. We can look at the body condition of the animal. We can get more information from what you're seeing as far as is it is it running quickly or is it really slowing down? And we wanna get a broader picture of that situation. And those are questions that it, we often get. Just this last fall, I mean, we were answering like four or five a day, you know, what's, what's going on with this fox? What's going on? Uh, is it mange? Is it not? Is it okay? And we're happy to do that. You know, we're we're so happy to help determine if that animal even needs help or if it needs to come in. And if that's the case and you're a local New Jersey resident, you know, we could potentially have the animal come in for treatment at our center. Okay, thank you so much, Heather. Let's see, another question for Eric. Do the over slash underpasses get used by wildlife? Are there any wildlife cameras installed? Just to put an answer back in chat, but yes, um, we, we have cameras on some of those uh, underpasses or other bridges to monitor, uh, you know, like wildlife usage. You know, we're, we're trying to document how many animals actually will uh, go under a road versus, you know, prefer to go up on top and cross the road. A lot of animals do not like their feet wet. Um, so the way we design our bridges often we just build them to, to do the bare minimum to cross a river or stream, uh, or we put a pipe in. And so animals will not go into a pipe or in a stream. Um, some, some will, but some do not like it. So they will, despite it being more dangerous, walk up on top of the road. So we do have cameras in the landscape in Northwest New Jersey. And the answer is yes, we, we have documented uh, large animals from black bear to raccoons uh, using these tunnels that go under uh, under the roadways. Um, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of design that go into it because the, the Department of Transportation has to build fencing along the roadway 
so that animals don't try to cross and then they run into the fence and then they follow the fence line and it's designed such a way that it actually points those animals to that culvert. So there's a lot of science and design that go into it. It's not just by happenstance that they find these tunnels. Okay, great, thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. So let's see here, we'll do one for, this one's for Woodlands. Um, do the animals get tagged before they are released? I'll take that. Um, the only animals that are tagged before they're released are the black bears. Um, the bears are part of the greater um, research project that are happening um, with the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Um, for many, 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 many years, the New Jersey black bears have been a constant research project. So all of the bears that we release go out, they get tagged, they get tattooed, they get DNA samples taken. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, the really wonderful part of, of that, so those 100 bears that we've worked with um, have gone out and, and as part of that greater research project, the rehabilitation and release project has been proven highly successful. We do have bears that, that were out there and have had several litters of cubs and we have third generations documented and um, that was as of 2012, so there may be quite a few more <laughs> generations out there that are documented. I know that the effort is there too to tag the bobcats that we put out. Um, sometimes easier than others to get a, an ear tag in a bobcat. Um, and that's something that we work with the biologists on making sure that we can do whatever we can. We usually are able to get DNA samples and at least have that tracking capability. For the, the tagging and um, you know, uh, tracking the progress of the animals release, you know, as you heard in the beginning, we're working with you know, 1,700 animals. Um, it would be really hard to, I don't know, Heather, would we have 300 and some raccoons and 400 squirrels and 300 rabbits? And you know, it's, uh, they're common animals in New Jersey. Their, their populations are pretty much solid and firm. Um, so the, the cost and the um, tracking and all of those things that take time, money, supplies are, are focused on the animals that are um, endangered or we're working with other organizations that are doing that. It was a really good question. I'm not sure if we actually want to know what happens to every single animal <laughs> that we release out there. We've given them their second chance and we're hoping for the best and you know, we're assuming they all go out and live long, happy wild lives and have lots of babies. I'd like the, to think the same, Tracy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to give a really big thank you to our uh, presenters today. This presentation was absolutely fascinating and um, it was just really inspiring to see, uh, first of all, just the importance of the apps and um, all the work that is going into land conservation by TNC and the wildlife rehabilitation by Woodlands and I think it's just so great that our groups can you know get together and collaborate um, and work on these really important issues. So um, we look forward to programming with you again and working with you for many more years to come and uh, I just want to thank our audience also for spending your lunch hour with us. We really appreciate you being here. Um, be on the lookout for a follow-up email from us. It will include all of the links to uh, you know Woodlands websites and social medias, as well as um, the video that was in this presentation and the recording for the webinar if you want to watch it at a later date or share it with friends and family. So thank you all again for being here today and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now. So long everyone. <laughs>